One of my life's biggest achievements was working in a tool store for five years and spending three years of those wages in the very same store I was working in. Hand tools, power tools, machinery. I've got the lot here. I've even started making some of my own. It's become a bit of an obsession, so you can imagine how I felt when I heard this. Yeah, Thomas Anderson says, any chance of you checking out slash testing the new Amazon Basics woodworking tools they're starting to put out? They have a Stanley number four plane clone currently. You've added it to the basket, have you? Yep. The order was placed right there on the spot. I had to see what this thing was like. February rolled around, no sign of it. March, no sign of it. April, nope. May, nope. June, July. Come on, it's 2020. What's happening in the world that could possibly hold this up? Eventually, I get a message from Amazon explaining that the order has been canceled. The journey has ended before it's even started. I feel defeated. And then, when all hope was lost. What in God's name is this? So we finally got one, an Amazon Basics plane, courtesy of a very kind viewer of this channel. And this leaves us with three questions. Firstly, how well does it work? Secondly, how long will it take me to get it working to a high standard? And thirdly, how much will it cost me to do this? All we need is a benchmark. Let's say... A Lee Nelson bench plane that currently retails at £338.28 in the UK. This plane costs £38.95 plus £17.69 shipping, equaling £56.64. Work out the difference between the two of them, £281.64. My hourly rate is £30, so £281.64 divided by 30 should give me the amount of time I have to work on this. The first thing I wanted to check out was the blade. No matter what price you spend on a plane, it will never be ready out the box. And given the state of this thing, it was no exception to the rule. Despite doing my best, there was a significant bump in the middle of the blade that was almost impossible to remove. After somewhat flattening the back, I reground the blade to get rid of the rough finish on the primary bevel. This step isn't completely necessary, but I thought it may save me some effort when producing the secondary bevel. I sharpens to 6,000 grit. So the process of flattening and sharpening the blade took just under an hour because there was a huge bump in the bottom of the blade that just had to go. The only thing that actually kept the process under one hour was the fact that the steel for this was so soft. A giveaway for this was the gigantic burr that was left behind while sharpening. Look at the size of it. Next I moved on to the chip breaker and look at it compared to a Lee Nielsen. The mating surface between this and the blade was diabolical and needed to be flattened. But not only that, it had a chrome finish on it that I absolutely despised. So I got to work stripping it back to bare metal. Now what you just saw was the beautiful end result of sharpening and setting up a plane correctly. However, what I failed to show you was the royal nightmare I had getting it there in the first place. There are multiple potential causes for this that I intended to rule out one by one. The first port of call was the frog, which is this part of the plane. This is what holds the blade at the desired angle while supporting it throughout the cut. It's also what the blade slides on when being adjusted. Now I don't know about you, but I think I'd have better luck sliding on sharp rocks than this thing. So I removed it from the plane and began flattening it.
After flattening the frog, I went to reassemble the plane. However, upon doing so, I noticed the frog was rocking on the casting below, which is a big no-no if you want to take thin, consistent shavings with the plane. I flipped the frog over and noticed a poor quality finish on the surface that mated the plane casting. To remedy this, I decided to mount the entire frog in the honing guide and flatten this area too. Seeing as I was already working on the frog, I decided to work on its cosmetics as well as they were somewhat lacklustre. My favourite part being the pivot point for the lateral adjuster. I'm pretty sure they installed this with a gun. After flattening the frog into something that somewhat resembled a slippery surface, the adjustments were working better but not as well as I'd hoped. I had to look deeper. I began looking into the mechanisms to see what clues I could find and I noticed there was some suspicious burnishing on the thrust wheel. To give you some context here, when this wheel travels up and down the thread, it pivots this little mechanism called the yoke. When the yoke pivots, it pushes the blade out or pulls it back, depending on the direction you spin the wheel, of course. The yoke wraps around both sides of the thrust wheel and if it's slightly too tight or the surface is rough, there's going to be excessive friction when the wheel turns, which is exactly what I was experiencing. So I began filing and smoothing it out. Again, this made a notable difference to the action of the plane, but it still wasn't working as intended. Going back a few steps, remember the frog rocking on the casting below? Well, I managed to uncover another problem related to this. It turns out that not only was the frog sitting unevenly on the casting, but the mouth had also been cut unevenly too. Previously, this error was cancelled out by the frog locking down at an angle. No, I don't want the banana again. But upon fixing it, I uncovered this new problem of a wonky mouth. As a result, this caused the blade to stop advancing when being set up for a cut. The blade was now able to advance from the sole of the plane, so we're back to where we were a few steps ago. What really grinded my gears, however, was that it still didn't work. This one took a bit of figuring out, but upon closely inspecting the yoke, I noticed that the pin it pivoted on was not actually round, but rather a shape that somewhat resembled a Torx bit. However, on my Lee Nielsen, it was perfectly round and polished. There were two problems with this. Firstly, the rough finish on the pin increased friction within the mechanism, but secondly, what made this worse was that the hole in the yoke was significantly larger than the pin itself, thus was causing the yoke to tilt and bind every time the thrust wheel was rotated in a different direction. Unfortunately, I was unable to simply replace the pin due to various issues with reinstalling it back in the frog, so I decided the best option was to create a bronze bushing that was a press fit over the existing pin. This would produce a smooth surface for the yoke to pivot on and was also relatively easy to create. Oh, I haven't got my cutting speed to chart. Once the bushing was fitted, I needed to widen the existing hole on the yoke in order to accommodate it. This was a weird shape to clamp and I'm sure me doing this will tickle the jimmies of all engineers watching this, but I found the easiest way to ensure I lined up everything accurately was to simply skewer the yoke on the drill bit while it was in the milling machine, then use this to locate the vice jaws below. This was then drilled to a few hundredths of a millimetre wider than the bushing and then we attempted to get it fitted. The first fit was a little too tight and despite me trying to bodge it, required me to make a second attempt. I shaved a few hundredths off the diameter and tried it again. It was now time to see the fruits of my labour. Uh-huh, uh-huh, I see that. Oh, a bit more up there. Oh, no, okay. I think the Lee Nelson's got it. Just. Just though, innit? Are you getting a little bit of slide when you, uh, when you were pushing them anyway? That's true, if I get that in. 
that's what was binding before. That's smooth as silk now. Yeah. Okay, that's it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've made it better than the Lee Nelson. With the combination of the bushing and some oil, as you can see, this made an unbelievable difference to the smoothness of the mechanism. Every little thing you do just makes it just a tiny bit better. With the mechanisms now working smoothly, I turned my attention to flattening the sole. It's important to note here, when pressure from the lever cap is applied, it distorts the sole ever so slightly. So it is important to flatten the sole with the frog, blade and lever cap in situ to ensure this distortion was accounted for. As you'll see at the end of the video, the sides of this plane were so far out of square, I didn't even bother trying to square them off. I just polished them for cosmetic reasons instead. The next job was the handles, and I'm pretty sure Amazon opted to finish these in chocolate as opposed to a traditional wood finish. Not only was the colour rather unsightly, but the finish felt very rough and plasticky, so I started by stripping it off. Fun fact though, turns out the front handle was made from maple and the rear handle was made from beech. After some experimentation, I managed to create a beautiful amber finish by creating a concoction of brown and orange stain, which then had a few layers of Skelton Saw's peacock oil applied after. The next job was to strip off the thick, uneven and chipped paint from the sole of the plane. This was due to be replaced with a thinner coat of black paint with a less glossy sheen than the original. Before applying the paint however, I decided to file and polish the top of the sole's walls to match the polished finish on my Lee Nielsen. The base looked absolutely incredible after being repainted and repolished. However, time was beginning to wear very thin at this point and I was quite worried I wasn't gonna make it. The final few jobs were surrounding the plane's cosmetics, such as removing chrome finishes, cleaning paint overspray, polishing and oiling mechanisms and cleaning various components of the plane. The finish line was in sight. Alright, before I show you the result, let me tell you why I think a lot of woodworkers are hypocrites. You see, I hear a lot of woodworkers say that expensive tools are a waste of money because you can get the job done with cheap tools. And while that may be true, I see the same woodworkers complain that the general public keep buying cheap, mass-produced furniture, as opposed to spending their money on handmade furniture that a craftsman has spent time and care on making. Well. The same could be said for these tool manufacturers that you're dismissing as a waste of money. These manufacturers have built high quality tools that will outlast you, all while being passionate about their craft, which is more than can be said for the company responsible for the plane under this cloth. And look, I get it, money, budgets come into that somewhat, but if you take anything from this video, anything at all, don't let it be that you can make a cheap plane perform the same as a Lee Nielsen or any other premium plane for that matter. Because underneath all this shininess is poor materials, cheap labour and one less sale for a passionate business owner that actually cares. Think about that. Right, that's put a downer on everything. <laughs> Let's show you the result, shall we? Rock!
seeing as this plane's now received the love and attention it deserves, I'm selling it. I don't want it. Link in description. <laughs>